Okay, as the last example of uh, the versatility of the finite element method, let us take a problem in fluid mechanics. Again, we will start with the governing equations. We are not so worried about the physical meaning of the governing equations. We will only try to deal with them as partial differential equations and set up a finite element problem. Now, uh, finite element in fluid mechanics is a, is a, is a big field of active research and uh, there are specialized courses that deal with finite elements in fluid mechanics only. So we don't have time for that here, uh, but we will just concentrate on a, a rather simple case where we have a viscous incompressible fluid flow, uh, fluid which is also a slow fluid. Uh, it's flowing slowly so that certain assumptions can be made and the equations look um, equations can be brought down to levels which are similar to what we have encountered in solid mechanics. So uh, let us first write down the Newton's laws of viscosity for the stress components. Uh, we, are, we are in 2D again as in the heat transfer case we are looking at 2D. So we have two at every point uh, we have two velocities the x velocity is u the y velocity is v and um, we also have pressure at each and every point and uh, the Newton's laws of viscosity says that the deviatoric stresses, the deviatoric stresses depend on the rate of the gradient of the velocity field. So um, in, in solids it depends on the gradient of the displacement field whereas here it depends on the gradient of the velocity field that is the major difference between uh, fluids and solids. So, uh, uh, so sigma xx is given by a deviatoric part which is uh, mu is the viscosity and uh, the gradient is again given by let's say dij is half vi comma j plus vj comma i where uh, v1 is u and v2 is v that is what we have taken and this dij so the deviatoric stress sigma ij prime is given by uh, 2 mu uh, okay mu times dij so this is the constitutive equation for the deviatoric stress since we are dealing with an incompressible flow the this the stress can now be determined the total stress that is sigma ij can be determined from sigma ij prime up to a undetermined pressure p so we cannot determine the total stress the entire total stress from the constitutive equation alone because it's an incompressible flow and uh, therefore this p is undetermined from the constitutive equation. So the total stress sigma xx that is sigma ij is sigma ij prime plus one third sigma kk delta ij. This you must have learned in your uh, solid mechanics courses also. So sigma xx that is sigma 1 1 will be sigma 1 1 prime plus uh, one third sigma kk and the sigma one third sigma kk will denote it by minus p and this cannot be determined from uh, from the constitutive equations alone what can be determined is only the deviatoric part which in this case will turn out to be mu times d11 plus d11 which is uh, <coughs> which is mu times del v1 del x1 or uh, sorry 2 mu times del v1 del x1 which is equal to 2 mu times del u del x in our notation. So that is what we have written for the deviatoric part of the stress and then the p is undetermined. Similarly for sigma yy uh, this is the deviatoric part sigma yy prime and p is undetermined. Sigma xy of course for sigma xy when uh, i is 1 2 this is equal to sigma 1 2 prime because this delta ij is 0. So when we are dealing with sigma xy, uh, the constitutive equation does determine sigma xy completely and it turns out to be d12 plus d21 which is del u del y 
plus del V del X in our case. So we will also assume that we are uh, we are dealing with slow flows. We'll make several assumptions as we go along in order to keep this problem tractable and doable in, in, in a short time. So uh, the first thing that we will, uh, we will <coughs> assume going forward is that this quantity where uh, this is the gradient of V, which is del Vi del x j e i e j this is the gradient of the velocity dotted with the velocity itself is very small and uh, is equal to zero so this assumption uh, has physical significance it has physical consequences uh, it is a suitable assumption for slow and sluggish flows why it is so uh, to, to know why it is so, you need to look at uh, our fluid mechanics textbook. Uh, you, you should do that. Uh, we will not go into the reasons for this assumption, but just say that this is an assumption suitable for the slow flows that we are considering. This assumption will be inherent in our, uh, in our derivations. So we are now going to use sigma ij comma j, which plus bi equal to rho u. Uh, vi dot so uh, this is the acceleration term we will take body forces to be non-existent so in 2d we will have two equations sigma xx comma x plus sigma xy comma y equal to rho vx dot that is rho u dot in our notation and sigma xy x plus sigma y y rho v dot. This would be our two governing equations and this is the time <coughs> time derivative of u. Uh, so the time derivative, the total derivative of let's say a ve velocity component vi that is we denoted by capital DVP is the total derivative of vi and this is a function of both position as well as time. And this is given by the chain rule del vi del t into dt dt plus del vi del x k del dx k dt. dx k dt in turn is equal to vk. So uh, if you remember your tensor as well, this means that v dot will be written as if you translate this into vector notation, it would be v dotted with gradient of v. And by my assumptions, this is small. So this is almost equal to zero in my case, so that the right hand side of these equations are simply rho times del u del t and rho times del v del t for the kind of flows that we are considering. Okay, so uh, this is what we are going to do now. We are going to take this uh, these constitutive assumption, plug it back into the equilibrium equation with the assumption that v dot grad v is almost equal to zero and therefore the right hand side is just the partial derivative of the velocities with respect to time. So uh, that is what we have done here and once you do that you have these two equations. So these this first term is sigma xx comma x this term is sigma xy comma y actually the first term is uh, sigma xx prime and this is for the pressure term and similarly this is sigma xy comma x and this is sigma yy prime comma y and this is the pressure term so this together is equal to 
sigma y y comma y this and this together is sigma x x comma x okay and the right hand side is of course just the time derivatives here uh, apart from that you have the continuity equation <coughs> we have taken a uh, incompressible flow so del rho del t is equal to zero which means that the uh, continuity equation boils down to del u del x plus del v del y equal to zero so this continuity equation has to be satisfied for by u and v so u and v at each and every point has to satisfy uh, have to satisfy these two equations which are equilibrium equations coming from balance of linear momentum as well as the mass balance or continuity equation that is written as uh, written here as this okay so now this these two equations have to be these three equations have to be satisfied at each and every point and the <coughs> easiest way to these are of course strong forms the easiest way to calculate weak forms would be to uh, would be to take the galkin root and uh, and try to see how far we can get towards uh, towards formulating the weak forms uh, before doing that, uh, we can we, we we should also look at the boundary conditions, and we are assuming here that you have a control volume, uh, which is uh, v, and uh, the boundary of the control volume is del v, and we are assuming that all over del v, uh, you have specified tractions. Then the then the boundary conditions turn out to be exactly the same, as in case of solids. So T x is specified as tx bar uh, tx is equal to so tx is specified as tx bar which is equal to sigma xx nx plus sigma xy ny which is the Cauchy relation where n is the outward normal and uh, then sigma xx is 2 mu del u del x minus p nx and sigma xy is mu times del u del y plus del v del x n y similarly t y bar will be sigma x y n x and sigma y y n y so <coughs> what we have now is a set of three pds the three pds being uh, two equilibrium equations one continuity equation and then these boundary conditions uh, and the three variables the field variables are u v and p so velocities at every point and the pressure of course we can have parts of the boundary where the velocities are specified we are not considering that that is actually an easy thing to consider over and above what we have shown here we are not considering that please remember that uh, we are assuming that the whole of del v is uh, is uh, subjected to boundary conditions of the traction type so uh, so just remember that now uh, once we have the have all the boundary conditions and the differential equations lined up uh, we can apply the Galerkin uh, principle so to apply the Galerkin principle we will take three basis functions w1 w2 w3 for the three equations and these are the this is the first equation that we had this is the second one and this is the continuity equation we multiply them by w1 w2 w3 uh, so the term inside the parenthesis is equal to zero if you multiply it by a function it remains equal to zero if you integrate it over the volume now it still remains equal to zero and uh, these are the three equations that are the starting points of our weak form now <coughs> this these three weak forms we will have to consider we will have to convert into a form that is amenable to the finite element method to do that uh, we have a straightforward procedure um, and uh, it's 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 straightforward but uh, slightly long and it involves the application repeated application of uh, the divergence theorem so uh, let me show that for the first equation 
let me show that for the first equation and uh, we have done it many times already in different contexts but let me still show it for the first equation you can do it for the second equation and um, and then uh, we will discuss the final expressions that we, we, we get let us work on the first equation uh, and the others you can do by on your own so uh, in the first equation the divergence theorem will be applied to a few terms so this is the first one the procedure is exactly the same as we have done so many times before so w1 times del del x of 2 mu del u del x is the term dv so this you will write in terms of two expressions one is del del x of w1 uh, 2 mu del u del x minus so this is the first term and the second term is del w1 del x into 2 mu del u del x dv so this is these are the two terms the first term is amenable to uh, divergence theorem so this becomes over dv uh, w1 2 mu del u del x nx dv and this remains this remains now at the boundary uh, everywhere attractions are specified so uh, these these terms will contribute towards tractions we will see that in a moment now uh, let's go to this term we'll do exactly the same steps here and uh, we should get so we start with w1 del del y mu we start with this and we break it up into two integrals as usual this is del del y of w1 times mu this minus del w1 del y again the first term is amenable to divergence theorem so this becomes And this remains this remains so now you see that uh, uh, this surface term and this surface term together uh, this together gives you uh, w1 tx bar dx because uh, well not yet not yet uh, let me do one more step I'm sorry so uh, let's go back deal with this term now so this term is w1 del p del x dv over v which will become just like we have done before uh, a surface integral which will be w1 p nx ds minus uh, del w1 del x times p d v so this is what it will become now uh, now let us take the surface terms together 
the signs are different remember this these have minus signs in front this is minus sign so this is these are minus this is plus go back this also has a minus sign so this is minus this is plus this is minus this is plus this has a plus sign so these signs are okay now uh, you will see easily that this term is w1 times w1 times uh, sigma x y and y and this term and this term together are w1 times sigma xx and x and together they form the fraction over del v which is w1 times tx bar where tx bar is the specified value of the fraction so so the surface terms together uh, will will amount to this i think with a minus sign i think with a minus sign so the first volume term is here so that is w1 times rho del q del t this is the first volume term the second volume term comes from this uh, and is this one so that's uh, with a with a plus i think or with a minus del w1 del x into 2 mu del u del x so that's with a plus okay and then there's another volume term coming from the pressure which is this one with a minus so this is del w1 del x times p and there's another remaining volume term again with a plus is this one plus del w1 del y into mu times del u del y plus del u del x and these all have a dv the surface term we have already seen is uh, is uh, w1 times tx bar and that has a minus uh, so we'll deal with that later now uh, this uh, now we want to express it in terms of <coughs> uh, in terms of uh, matrices so to do that uh, we will define two matrices so first we will define a matrix of uh, a vector of the of the uh, basis function so we'll uh, we have a vector of basis functions which contain w1 w2 we have a vector of the field variables the velocities u and v and look at this volume term and this volume term so we can write it as um, in this manner del w1 del x 0 and del w1 del y times uh, 2 mu del u del x then 0 then mu times del u del y plus del v del x you can ask me why I'm putting these zeros here uh, I'm keeping room for uh, for handling the second equation uh, you will see that in a moment so uh, this part I can further write it like mu times 2 2 1 times del u del x 0 uh, 0 okay so i can write it like this and um, and this one I can further write it as
uh, if you now multiply these three uh, these three matrices you will see that you will get this term and this term now i'm cheating here a bit because i know the final answer uh, i had no reason to bring in this del w tools uh, because i have not even handled the second equation where the w2 comes from but i know that uh, that that from the structure of it i know that w2 uh, will give rise to these terms and i am bringing them in in hindsight and uh, <coughs> the beauty of this equation is uh, this form and this form are the same both of them are uh, this operator matrix this operator matrix times uv either uv which gives you this or you replace u1 u by uv by w1 w2 you get this or the transpose of this so uh, this is actually uh, if if i call this operator matrix d so this is actually uh, w transpose d this we will give it a name this whole thing will give it a name c and this is actually d times v where v is this vector this is your w so these two are uh, the, the this will be the form of the equation when you have dealt with uh, both of these this as well as this we have shown how to deal with the first one you can deal with the second one in pretty much the same way once you have done that you should get this equation the second term in this on the right hand side comes from of course the second equation and uh, that you deal with it exactly like we have dealt with the first equation and please make sure that this is a set of equations that you get from this we still have to do deal with this uh, it remains pretty much the same except that we write it in terms of the operator so we can write it like uh, like this uh, del del x del del y u v dv so we can write it like this now <coughs> that's what we have done here so this is the third equation in weak form now uh, what you can see from here is uh, the structure of the equations this is reminiscent of b transpose cb uh, these are additional terms so this whole thing is a problem which we can solve with elements that have three degrees of freedom per node u b and p so that is one way of solving it the second thing that you see here is that uh, for u and v you have first derivatives entering entering the variational principle whereas for p you have only the value of p entering the variational principle which means that the that the requirements on the basis functions that we choose for u and p u v and p are different for u and v we can at least we we should at least have a linear approximation otherwise these terms will go to zero right but for p we can have a constant approximation over the element so uh, only p enters this so we can have a constant approximation over p and it is possible that we have different kinds of approximating functions that means different orders of shape function for the velocities and the pressure uh, this is actually done and these are called hybrid elements and there are various kinds of hybrid elements that have been developed several uh, have been developed for incompressible fluid flow problems and there are ways of um, ways of doing this hybrid uh, interpolation uh, one way of doing it is uh, take a four noded quadrilateral with a central node <coughs> that velocities are interpolated at the corners whereas the pressure is interpolated only at the center so the pressure is not shared the pressure in this element is not shared with any other element um, this is one way there are other ways as well 
uh, we will not uh, not look uh, at those uh, at those kinds of formulations in detail because that will take quite a bit of time. Uh, what we will do now is uh, figure out another way of solving these equations. So what we are going to do is we are going to solve these two equations and treat this third equation or this condition, this equal to zero, the incompressibility condition as a constraint and formulate what is known as a constrained, uh, constrained variational uh, principle. So uh, let's see how we do that. So we'll look at it as, as a constrained uh, problem and uh, we'll again go back to our um, variational principle that we have derived and for simplicity we will make the further assumption that the velocities are not uh, strong functions of time. So this term can be dropped out, this term can be dropped out let's say and then this term as we have already written it in terms of an operator, we can write it as del del x 0 0 del del y and del del y del del x. So this is an operator and uh, this term can be written as uh, d <coughs> of w transpose c d of so this is what we will write it as. We will define another operator, let's say one, which is del del x del del y. And this term we can write as d1 transpose w. Okay. And uh, to frame the frame the we can, there, there are various ways in which we can now frame the uh, weak form and uh, one way is to now identify, uh, now say that W, uh, we'll call it del U, W1 and W2, we'll call it del V. So this is V times del U and this is, uh, this is D1 transpose times del u. Remember w1, w2 are, um, are um, arbitrary functions and we can give them any names. So uh, I, I just I've changed the name here, nothing else. So uh, I can now have a new um, weak form where I have neglected the neglected the time dependent terms. I have taken it to be steady state. I have just dropped them out. So this term and this term remains. And uh, out of that, the first term I have written in this manner so that when I take del pi, I will get d times delta v transpose C D times V, you can check this out. This will give me this equation. So you have this half here. So first you will do a delta of this V, then you will do a delta of this V, but these two terms are the same. So you can add them up and this is what you will get from the first term. And if you look at this first term, if, if you look at this first term, you will see that it is exactly same as what we have got here, if you replace W1 with delta U and W2 with delta V. So it's the same term that we have got here. So uh, this term <coughs> is the same as the second term in that long equation. Again, uh, this guy, if you take its uh, variation, first variation will give rise to del V transpose V bar Vs over delta V, which is the same as what we have on the right hand side here. It's exactly the same term that we have got. Now we are going to drop the pressure terms. We are going to drop the pressure terms from here and we will only retain these two, right? 
we should have had a pressure term, but we have only retained these two. Instead of the pressure term, we will bring in this new term called the penalty term. What it does is it I, I have the, I have this function gv which is defined as just del u del x plus del v del y. So what I want is all deviations from and, and gamma is known as a penalty number. So if this deviates from zero, we want it to be zero all the time. If this deviates from zero, because gamma is a large number, uh, this integral, this whole quantity becomes large and penalizes the total energy. So if it penalizes the total energy, remember we are trying to reduce the total energy. So one way to stop this from penalizing is to maintain this g at zero. So the constraint will be maintained because this penalty number will increase the cost of deviating from the constraint. If you deviate from the con constraint, the penalty number will ensure that you pay a huge penalty on the energy and as a result, it will try to keep this at zero so that this does not add to uh, the total energy. <coughs> so this is this is similar to how we dealt with incompressibility, remember, in cases where uh, Poisson's ratio tended to half, we dealt with it in pretty much the same way and that's what we are trying to set up here. So we are not setting up the pressure as an additional variable. We are solving for u and v at the nodes, but we are imposing the incompressibility condition as an penalty term in the variational principle. So uh, just to uh, recapitulate, this was dropped because we had taken steady state. That's an assumption. We have retained this term and this term here, but we have dropped this term and replaced it with a penalty term. So P is no longer a nodal variable uh, in our problem. Now, once you have done this, so uh, the first term, if you take delta of this, the first term becomes this, the second term becomes this, as we have already shown, and the third term, the penalty term, now can be written as, I'm sorry, there's a gamma here. So this penalty term now can be written as um, uh, D1 transpose B, so that uh, I have GV square, which would be uh, V transpose D1 times D1 transpose V. And when you take derivative of that, so you have, uh, you have half gamma uh, G square. So you have gamma by two G square. When you take a first variation of that, you will get gamma del V transpose d1 times d1 v. So <coughs> this is what you will get when you take delta of this, which is same as delta of this, right? So <coughs> this is what you will get. And I have written it. Uh, so d1, this is, this is d1, this is d1 transpose and uh, so I have written it as V transpose D1, D1 transpose delta V, which is also same as, uh, which is, which is same as this. So you can write it either like this or you can write it like this. Both are the same. Now, uh, what you can see immediately by comparing with the previous expression, previous expression, we had this term. Uh, we had this pressure term. We had this pressure term. And we had uh, called now W1 as delta U and W2 as delta V. So what we had was minus P this is what we had which is same as minus P times D1 into delta V. This is what we had. Now uh, this, this is what we had in the previous case when, when we treated pressure explicitly. When we treat it through this penalty constraint, uh, then we get a similar term here. We get a similar term from P. So this must be equal to 
this must be equal to minus p times d1 transpose delta v. I'm sorry, this there's a d1 transpose here. And this is what it is, which means that now minus p will be gamma v, v transpose d1 which if you write it down will be equal to gamma del u del x plus del v del y. So p is equal to minus of this. So now uh, your gamma takes the role of the bulk modulus. So this is like your uh, volumetric strain and this takes the role of the bulk modulus and gives you the pressure. So gamma has uh, gamma plays the role of P in this formulation and uh, that is the beauty of it. Uh, more is your penalty number, larger is your penalty number, you, you have to choose this. So larger is your penalty number, better is this constraint imposed and therefore better will be the incompressibility condition uh, valid in your simulations. So again to recapitulate in the penalty formulation you do not take u, v and p as nodal variables, you take only u and v as nodal vari variables, then gamma is a, is, a, is a pressure that you choose and gamma is a number that you choose and then uh, try to impose the incompressibility condition as, an, as, a, as a constraint in your variational uh, problem. Obviously, there are there, there now you can go ahead and formulate the finite element equations. I am not going through this because this is pretty much straightforward. You have this, you have this variational principle, and then you go step by step, make the assumptions on u, u v, and <coughs> in terms of the shape functions, carry it out exactly like we have done in the other cases, and you will be able to uh, derive. Uh, these basic equations. Now these are the finite element equations. This is what you will solve. Again you have the k ku equal to f form for every element which is which is always always the case and um, choice of penalty parameter uh, is important here. Remember uh, this Kp is called the penalty stiffness. This is the stiffness that contains the penalty parameter. The choice of the penalty parameter is of course very important. Uh, if it's very large, if it's very large, the constraints are better imposed. But what might happen is Kp might overwhelm Kv. As a result, your total matrix may be dominated by Kp and therefore uh, you may get ill conditioning. On the other hand, if gamma is too small, then the constraint is not imposed, constraint is not imposed properly and therefore incompressibility is not maintained in your problem. So you have to choose gamma carefully and if you choose it, of course, this might be able, uh, you might be able to solve a problem of incompressible fluid flow using this formulation. So uh, this, is, uh, this is one part of it. Uh, if gamma is too large, then there's a problem of locking, which is similar to what we saw in the case where nu was nu tended to half in case of a linear elasticity problem. And in this case also under integrating Kp, so doing, for example, using a four noded quadrilateral again, and then using two cross two for Kv, but one cross one for Kp under integrating Kp sometimes alleviates the problem with locking and that is there are techniques that have been devised uh, to, to uh, systematically under integrate the penalty, penalty term so that it does not overwhelm Kv and it works for many 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 elements. We have discussed a bit of this under integration when we dealt with the case of nu tending to half 